Hello, this is the seventh lesson of our composition workshop. In this lesson, we are going to start with the analysis of Pierre Boulez Masochewski's, which was composed in 1976 for violoncello solo and six accompanying violoncellos. The pieces we talked about in our previous lessons were short pieces, or maybe a little longer, but um, with a slow development, and they had a simple structure. But in this video, we are going to see, by the way, the piece is also composed with the Zahar hexachord, and you are going to see how complicated it could be. This is a relatively longer piece, it is about 7-8 minutes. Uh, according to the version, according to the performance, the performance I picked is seven minutes approximately. It has very rapid passages. And you, you will see there's a lot going on in the piece. In my opinion, this is a perfect example of how complicated it could be without losing the coherence. Because it is not a difficult thing to make the things complicated, but it is a difficult thing to create a piece which has a very complicated background and at the same time preserve the coherence, the clarity, the unity within the elements. And this is a perfect example of this. Let's listen to it first and then we are going to talk about it. It is, by the way, impossible to analyze everything uh, in the piece. We have done it in our previous lessons, but in this piece it is not possible. It would take many hours to analyze everything, but it is also not necessary. If you understand the examples I'm going to show you now in this video, the entire piece will be clear for you. So. Let's listen to it and then we'll talk about it.
Believe or not, this is the entire pitch material of the piece. Every single pitch you heard in these seven minutes is represented here. There is no pitch added and there is no pitch removed. This is the entire pitch material, this is the entire pitch organization and this is the entire pitch structure of the piece. You can pause the video now and try to find out how he created this table, how he created the individual sets on this table, what is the principle that underlies this table. This is our pitch material table and this is our Zahar hexachord and this is its inversion. You see Every interval in the Zahar hexachord is inverted. If you compare them, the relation between them is difficult to see, but it will be clear if you look at this table. And you see here, this is the, by the way, this is the same table as the one that Holliger, that Heinz Holliger used in his piece, Chacon. And you see the Zahar hexachord is transposed on the pitches of its own inversion. You can find the Zahar, the intervals of the Zahar hexachord in every stuff. And how he gets this table from this table, the only thing he does is to start every pitch set with E flat. E flat is interestingly uh, diagonally placed in the table, and here every pitch set 
begins with E flat. For example, the fourth one begins here. E flat, A flat, F sharp, then turns back to the beginning. G natural, C sharp, and E natural. So this table will serve as basis for our analysis. This is the beginning of the piece and it is a very clear, extremely clear presentation of the original Zahar hexachord. Let's write the sounding pitches. The first one is an artificial harmonic. It will sound E flat 4. And then we have five natural harmonics. Natural, we can understand it from this uh, zero meaning open string. The first one will sound here, at uh, the second one, excuse me, and this will sound C4, and then we hear the fourth overtone of G string, it will sound here. This is the fifth overtone of A string. It will sound here. And finally, the third overtone of D will sound here. The presentation of Zahar hexachord. And what do the other violoncelli do? They do the following, they sustain the pitches introduced, which were introduced by the solo violoncello. E flat as artificial harmonic, and you see E flat in the first violoncello, first accompanying violoncello, and then A, C, and so forth. The same harmonics are sustained by the accompanying violoncellos. And at the end we hear the Zahar hexachord as a chord. And it is sustained. In the following system we have in the solo violoncello some phrases. Each phrase ends with a fermata here. And in the accompanying violoncellos, we hear the Zahar hexachord, it is sustained uh, until that point. At that point, the sixth accompanying violoncello stopped sustaining the D of the Zahar hexachord and start playing a figuration, a rhythmic figuration. In the first phrase, we hear individual pitches in the solo violoncello. But if we look at the second phrase, we will notice that we hear in each subphrase, we can call this subphrase, if we call the entire um, the entire measure as phrase, then we can call these units as subphrases. We hear two pitches in every subphrase. If we look at the third phrase, we will notice that there are three pitches in every subphrase. And additionally, you see here only one violoncello in the second phrase. One violoncello plays the rhythmic figuration. In the third one, two violoncelli. And in the fourth one, three violoncelli. And in the fourth phrase, we have four pitches in every subphrase. In the fifth phrase, we have five pitches in every subphrase and four accompanying violoncelli play the rhythmic figuration. And in the last one, we have five accompanying violoncelli playing the rhythmic figuration and also a rhythmic figuration in the solo violoncello. 
And if flat, the, the first pitch of Zahar hexachord is sustained, it serves as a, a central pitch throughout the piece. We will always hear E flat at some uh, important points, either accented or uh, sustained with a fermata, etc. Uh, by the way, also the rhythmic figurations are always on E flat. E flat, E flat, E flat. Uh, at the beginning, we hear the entire Zahar hexachord, and then one, one tone less, two tones less, three tones less, and at the end, we hear only E flat. We are going to talk about grace notes. If we ignore them, we hear only E flat here. So, let's start analyzing the individual phrases. After the introduction, which is merely a presentation of the Zahar Hexachord, we hear the first phrase in the violoncello. You can pause the video now and try to find out the connection between this phrase and our pitch material table. If you look at the pitches of the phrase, notice this is tenor clef, E flat, F sharp, F natural, B flat, A flat, and A as natural harmonic. We will find this order in our table in the second set with some enharmonic respellings. E flat, G flat is spelled as F sharp in the score, F natural, B flat, A flat, and A. We are going to see that the second set on our table uh, will be the beginning point for the following phrases. As I said, in the second phrase, we hear two pitches in every unit, in every subphrase. Once again, you can pause the video now and try to find the connection between this phrase and our pitch material table. Let's take a look at the main pitches. E flat, D, G, F, F sharp and C. And by the way, as you see, Boulez writes natural signs also for the pitches which were neither sharps or flats before. This is a characteristic of Boulez notation. He writes an accidental for every single pitch for clarity. So, if you look at the table you will see this order of pitches in our third set, beginning with E flat, D natural, G, F, F sharp, and C. Let's take a look at the grace notes. We have F sharp, F natural, B flat, G sharp, and uh, the notation is uh, unfortunately in a bad quality. This is a diamond note hat with a zero above it, meaning the open string. That means uh, natural harmonics, and it will be played on the A string. It will sound A. So. Beginning with E flat, if you look at our table, we will find this order in our second set with some enharmonic respellings. E flat, G flat, respelled as uh, F sharp in our score, F, B flat, A flat, it was G sharp in the score, and A natural. The structure is the following. He used only the second and third sets. The first pitch is the same in both sets and then. 
The pitches of the third set are always main notes and the pitches of the second set are always grace note. G is the main note and before that we hear a grace note etc. This will be important, this structure will be important for the following phrases. This is the third phrase and as you see we have three pitches in every subphrase. Once again you can pause the video and try to find out the connection between the phrase and our table. I'm sure you can do it quite fast now. If we take the main notes, E flat, G sharp, F sharp, G natural, C sharp and E natural, you will find and probably you expect to find them in the fourth set. Because the previous one was the third set and now we expect the fourth set and for the next one we expect the fifth set. So E flat, A flat, it is G sharp in the score, F sharp, G natural, C sharp and E. So the following, the grace notes. I remember the second phrase was um, the main tone from the third set and um, grace note from the second. Main tone from the third set, grace note from the second and we expect the same structure here and we have the same structure. Let's take a look at this one, at the second subphrase. As we said, the main note is A flat, G sharp in the score, the first note in the subphrase is F sharp, it is here. This is the first note. And then we have D natural, this one is the second note, and we have G sharp or A flat, this is the third note. If you look at the third subphrase, we have G natural and it is here. This is the first note in the subphrase and then we have F natural, this is here, this is the second one and we have F sharp, this is always the third one and in the fourth subphrase we have B flat, it is in the second set, F natural in the third set and then G. As you see he changes the order of the uh, pitches. He takes one pitch from the second set, another pitch from the third set and use them as grace notes but the order uh, is changed almost every time. Let's check it. This one F sharp is here and then G sharp is here and main tone is always here and the last one is once again, this is a diamond note hat, D, it will be played on A string and it will sound A, it is here. And we have uh, one C, it is here, and the main note here. We have such a structure here, one, two, one, two, and one, in the third set. We have 2, 1, 2, 1 and 2. Very systematic. This is the fourth phrase. As we expect, we have the pitches of the fifth set as main notes. E flat, C sharp, D, A flat, B natural, it changed to uh, F clef and then again to tenor clef B flat at the end. And once again as we expect he will use the tones of the second, third and fourth sets 
as grace knows. Let's check it. We have denatural. It is here. This is the first one. If you take a look at this one. G sharp and F sharp. The next one we have F natural, then we have G, then we have F sharp. Let's take this one. It begins with F natural. This is the first one and then second one and the third one. If you take this one, this is G sharp, C sharp. G sharp is here, C sharp is here, and uh, F sharp is here. At the last one, uh, it is uh, a natural harmonics on A string. It will sound A. This is the first one, and then we have a C, and then an E. If you look at the order of the pitches, I don't see any particular structure this time. In the previous one, we had a structure. Maybe there's a system, which I don't see, but I think this is only a musical decision by Boulez. But you are welcome to search for a system and tell me if you could find one. And this is the final one. This is the fifth phrase, which contains five pitches in every in every subphrase and we are familiar with the structure now we expect the the pitches from the sixth set as main tones we can check it e flat e natural b flat d flat c and f we have the main pitches here and then as expected he will use the other uh, sets, beginning, uh, beginning with the second set, uh, as grace notes, and in a mixed order. You can check it. I couldn't find any, uh, any particular structure, any particular principle in the order. I think he takes those pitches and creates... Uh, creates a pattern from those speeches according to his musical taste, I guess. But you are welcome uh, to search for a system and tell me if you could find one. I'll be very happy to hear it. This is the end of the first section. I call it first section beginning with the, uh, with the introduction the presentation of the Zahar Hexachord and then five phrases in the solo violoncello and this one I, I can call it the conclusion of the first section. Introduction, five phrases in the middle and then a conclusion. If you take a look at the conclusion we are going to see that we have E flat as main notes with rhythmization, with a rhythmic figure. We are going to talk about this rhythmic figure. And then we have some grace notes. Let's take only the solo cello line and compare it with our table. You can pause the video now and try to find out from which set or which sets are the grace notes coming. I'm sure it will be easy, beginning with E flat, A, C natural, B natural, E natural, and D. This is our original, original Zahar hexachord. If you take a look at the other violoncello parts, here notice E flat. E natural, B flat, D flat, C natural, and F. Notice the first three now, E flat, E natural, B flat. We will see them in 
our table in the last set. And let's take a look at the third violoncello, E flat, D flat, D natural, etc. Notice the first three, E flat, D flat, D natural. We will find it here, E flat, D flat, D natural, and so on. That was the second violoncello, this is the third one, this is the fourth one, this is the fifth one, and this will be the sixth violoncello. We can check it. Notice the first three, E flat, G flat, and F. I go back to the score. E flat, G flat, and F. This is our uh, second set. Let's talk about the rhythmical aspect of the piece. It is also a very important part of the structure. This is the end of the first section and you see many rhythmic figuration with a division between them. They are divided. That means we have one rhythmical pattern here, another one here and another one here. Let's remember the first time we saw them. This is the beginning of the piece, only sustained tones and this is the first phrase in the violoncello. And in the second phrase, the sixth accompanying violoncello stop, stopped playing uh, denatural from the Zahar hexachord and began to play a rhythmical pattern or a rhythmical figuration. You see it consists of three sixteenth notes and another one co consisting of one sixteenth and one eighth. So two patterns. And in the next phrase, also the fifth accompanying violoncello joined to the sixth one. And we have this time three rhythmic pattern. Two of them is the same, three sixteenth notes and one sixteenth and one eighth note. And we have a new one, one eighth, one sixteenth, one eighth, one sixteenth. And probably you know what is coming now. In the fourth phrase, we have three instruments and four rhythmic pattern. In the next one, we have four instruments and five rhythmic pattern. And this is the end of the first section. We have five accompanying celli and also the solo cello and six rhythmic pattern. You can pause the video now and make some thoughts about why those patterns. If you tried and couldn't find any solution, I'll give you a clue. This is the clue. What this is? This is Morse code. Uh, as you probably know, Morse code is used for telegraph signals, for letters. Today we have many ways, emails, uh, texting, etc. But in the old days, you have to go to the post office and give your message to the uh, to the man there, and he had to send a separate signal pattern for each letter. For example, let's say music. If your message, text message, contained uh, music, then first M. What is the signal for M? Two long signals with the electricity. Two long electricity signal. And then a break, a short break. Then comes U. What is the signal combination for U? Two short and one long. A, a short break. And then comes S. What is the combination for S? Three short signals, etc. That was the method which which was used in telegraph communication. 
And now back to our excerpt. You can pause the video now and try to find out the connection between these rhythmical patterns and the Morse code table. I'm sure you can figure it out now. So, the connection is the following, the first rhythmic pattern, and then we have a break. Three sixteenths, that means three short values. This is this one. Let's note it, S. And the second one, for now ignore the grace note and take this one. It is one short value and then one long value. And where is it? It is here. For A. One short and one long. Let's write it. And the, line, the next one, without grace note. Uh, it is about relativity. One longer value, one shorter one. One longer and one shorter. If you look at the table, you will find it here for C. And you already know what is going to come now. H and then E and then R. We can check it. Let's begin with R. Short, long, short. R is here. Short, long, short. E, what we see is only one short value. Once again, it is about relativity. What is short? In this pattern, that was short. And in the first one, that was short. And now it is short. This is about relativity. And for H, we should have uh, four short values. Yes, here H, four short values. So, he, he gives, he uh, realizes the letters of Zahar, of the name Zahar. We have Zahar hexachord and here it is used rhythmically. He quotes the Zahar via Morse code symbols. So, the short value, I said it is about relativity, it is about relativity, but we see also a, a, a systematical approach um, used in, the, in determining the short values. We have a triplet 16th at the beginning a triplet sixteenth, then we have a sixteenth alone, and then we have a triplet eight, and then only an eight. After that we have a dotted eight, sorry for the place, dotted eight here, and then a quarter. The values getting larger in every pattern. This is also true for the uh, longer values. First we have a, an 8 and then a triplet quarter and then we have here a, a half note. If you take a look at the other violoncellos, we will see that the patterns are different now. For example, that was short, long, short pattern and our short, long, short pattern is here. It is much shorter. And then we have three shorter values here. It is, it was triplet here and we have only sixteenth here. Short, long is the same. And then we have long, short, long, short, it is here. And for short is also shorter now. This one too. But within the violoncelli, he is consistent. He used only the same values. 
And if you look carefully, it is a rhythmical canon. Let's write the letters and R. You see, this is one short. This is E pattern. Here, here, here. This is a rhythmical canon. And everything, this is R. We see it here, here. The same pattern. And after E, R, we expect S. It turns back to the beginning, etc. And, and in every instrument, uh, this is a realization of a rhythmic canon. So, since we know everything about the first section, about the pitch organization, about the rhythmical structure, it would be a good point to listen to the first section only. That's all for this lesson. Thank you for watching and in the next video we are going to continue with our analysis.